freedom. Oh, oh, oh freedom. Pleasure to uh, see all the faces and names and uh, know that uh, this is uh, what we do well is is look at each other and talk to each other and hear historical stories. So here we are this evening. In recognition of those who walked this land before us, Simcoe County Historical Association acknowledges that we gather on the ancestral territory of the Anishinaabek nations, the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and Potawatomi, who collectively are known as the Three Fires Confederacy. We remember too the people of the Huron-Wendat who once made this land their home. We acknowledge with regret that in the past we have not lived in harmony with the indigenous people of Turtle Island and our relationship has not been one of true friendship based on honesty, generosity, and mutual respect. Today, we recognize the enduring presence of the people of the Chippewa Tri-Council of the Beausoleil, Georgina Island, and the Chippewas of Rama First Nations, as well as the people of the Métis Nation, the Inuit, and other First Nations who have chosen to make their homes in this region. The members of the Simcoe County Historical Association recognize that we have much to learn from the history, culture, and teachings of the Indigenous peoples with whom we now share this land. We are committed to nurturing a spirit of respect, honesty, and reconciliation with all our First Nations, Métis, and Inuit neighbors. And again, folks, welcome. Thank you, Donna. Uh, for those who, who might have missed, uh, that was Donna White. Donna is our uh, longtime executive member of the Sipco County Historical Society. She's not the old member, but she's a longtime member of, this, of the association and um, a very uh, effective uh, a uh, secretary and one who uh, keeps us on the short and uh, narrow path as we move forward. So I do want, my name is Deb Crawford. Uh, I'm a director with the Simcoe County Historical Association. Um, if you receive our newsletter, um, that's, um, that's what I, I try to put together every quarter and uh, try to find something interesting. So if you have something that uh, might make it a little bit more interesting or a story to tell. You can more, you're more than willing, or you're more than welcome to send me some uh, an email at uh, at uh, the um, uh, on our website, and I'll I'll gladly connect with you. So once again, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, February is Black History Month. It's a chance for all of us to celebrate the achievements and contributions of Black Canadians. The story of the oral African church begins in the wake of the War of 1812, one of the first communities to grant land to Black members of the Loyalist communities or Loyalist militia. Oro became home of the only Black community sponsored by the government. The church was built in 1847 and remained active to 1900. The church was declared a National Historic Site in 2000. Local residents rallied to preserve the site in 1947, 1956, 1981, and most recently in 2014. Tonight, Harry Hughes and Sama Othman are here to tell us what it took to save this national treasure. Harry has served as mayor of the township of Oro Medonte. Um, Mark, you've got problems there. Yeah, I'm taking it off. Okay. Um, Harry has served as mayor for the township of Oro Medonte for four consecutive terms. He served as deputy warden for the county of Simcoe for four years and as county council representative to Georgian College, Aurelia Soldiers Memorial, uh, Memorial Hospital, and the RVH. A former high school, uh, sorry, a former school principal 
He holds a master's degree in measurement and evaluation from the University of Toronto and bachelor degrees from L'Oreal University. Harry is proud to have led the team that ensured the integrity of the African church and is a proud recipient of the Canada 150 Volunteer Award. Sam held a communications position with the Township of Oro Medonte for 10 years before accepting a position of strategic communications officer with the Ontario Provincial Police Headquarters in Aurelia. For public relations and communications work on the Oral African Church crowdfunding campaign, earned her the 2017 Canadian Government Relations Campaign of the Year Award from the Canadian Public Relations Society of Canada. The Township of Oro Medonte received numerous awards and commendations from associations and government agencies, including two Lieutenant Governor of Ontario awards. So Harry, Sama, take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, Mr. Hughes, I will ask you to unmute your microphone. And if I can ask all the attendees to turn off their video, it'll help with the um, presentation and the videos that we'll be running. So I will share uh, my screen here. We will be sharing with you how a dilapidated church united thousands nationwide as a result of a successful crowdfunding campaign by the Township of Ormidante. The Oro African Church is a national historical site, national historical site, and since the township launched its uh, campaign to save the church, the project and story garnered national media attention and worldwide interest. As an Egyptian who is Muslim with no religious or ethnic ties to the church, I became passionate about it for its historical and cultural significance to Canada. This project has been the highlight of my career, and I am honored to present with Mr. Hughes and share our story with you today. Breakfast Television Toronto covered the story of the church and its significance to Canada. The story aired during Black History Month in 2017. Here is the clip that aired on breakfast television. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Oh, freedom. Oh, oh freedom. Slavery had actually only been abolished in Canada for a short few years. Yes, we had slavery here. But for those dreaming of freedom in the southern slave states, the northern states were not far enough to run. More and more, the final stops in the Underground Railway for many was the untamed wilderness of Upper Canada. It was here, on the shores of Lake Simcoe, that land grants were being given to white men and black men alike. A black man could also vote here. The hamlet of Shanty Bay, north of Barrie, takes its name from the shanties built here by former slaves. Whoa. Many in the black community helped to build this, St. Thomas Anglican Church in 1838. They've done an incredible job keeping this church alive, restoring it when needed. But only about 13 kilometers that way, we were in danger of losing a very important piece of black history in Ontario. Swing low, sweet child, we are coming for us to Swing. This is Janie Cooper Wilson. She can trace her family back nine generations to this area, including to a runaway slave from Virginia. Swing. These men fought in the War of 1812 against the Americans with a famed Captain Runchy Colored Brigade. Finally free, they would build this simple church in the wilderness of central Ontario. They were free, and that was the main thing. Um, they 
could be the masters of their own destiny. So you have faith. Um, all things are possible. When we did the uh, reopening of the church and sending out all of the invitations, there were invitations that went all the way, not only to British Columbia, but all the way to, to Newfoundland and from the United States to get an idea of how they all branched out from here. And we are who they were. I will now turn it over to Mr. Harry Hughes. Thank you, Sama. I wanted to uh, present this map in order to put things into context is that during the War of 1812, as you know, the United States invaded Canada. They used the uh, period of time that the British were at war with France uh, so that the uh, British wouldn't be able to defend. And critical to the defense of Upper Canada at that time was the uh, the groups that were, were involved. There was some British regulars, uh, of course, but there was the, and the militia, the Simple and Gray Foresters, but particularly there were a brigade of, of black soldiers and the First Nations group were really instrumental in holding the Americans off. And fortunately, the war of uh, eight, uh, between Britain, Britain and France uh, ended and the way the British handled it was that they attacked the United States and withdrew. However, they realized how vulnerable they would be. And so if you look at the map to understand where the settlement area was with the black community, you'll see how strategic it was. The, the uh, British set up a line of defense. When you see the length of the border, they knew they couldn't defend the whole border, but the key area of defense was a harbor at Penetang which controlled the upper Great Lakes. And so if you look at some of the uh, things they put in pl place, they're sort of amazing. You can see the road that's coming from the, the Monk Road that leads from Penetang Machine. That was built by, uh, under the guidance of Viscount Mike Monk, I should say. And that was a military road that came all the way from Ottawa to Penetang Machine. So Penetang Machine was really critical to the defense the British built a naval barracks there. And if you looked at where they placed the uh, lands for the First Nations, uh, you will find that they were in a direct line with a, any invasion route that the Americans might be taking to Penetang Machine. And one of the critical areas of all, which was a complement to the Black community, was the real significant pinch point, which went from Lake Simcoe, that short dot, up to Penetang Machine and they gave land grants to the black soldiers, the same, uh, and the, the amount of size of the land had to do with the military rank that the soldiers had. At the same time, in order to keep the defense all in place, they granted land to half pay officers. So those were the huge tracts of land along Shanty Bay uh, along and, and down along Lake Simcoe, the Rosses and, uh, and groups like that so that they would have commanders, they would have the uh, veteran soldiers, they would have the militia, and of course they would have the local residents as well to, to, uh, in line of their defense. Now, in addition to granting land, it was significant, they also gave the rights to the black community to, be, to vote, to have all the full rights that uh, everyone else was given, not only to vote, but also to, uh, to be able to worship on their own. And that was a significant aspect that would le lead to the building of the church that keeps this story alive. Next slide, please. Now we've already heard a bit of the uh, background about granting the land. So I'm going to focus and draw your attention to the church. And the as you can see, it was established in, 18, in 1941 and the, when you look at a building and you see a roof leaking, most people know that that building is beyond repair. So that shows you the dilapidated uh, condition of that uh, church. And this is a photo that was actually taken back in that time. And so the existing community, uh, particularly led by the Women's Institute, uh, Wilhelmina McKay, and uh, the 
initiated uh, the preservation of the church and went to the county of Simcoe, who actually established a committee. And they did a not only a restoration of the church, but they also upgraded a lot of the features, which there was a, it was a dirt floor in there at the time. They put in a wooden floor, wainscoting, and a number of other upgrades. And so they added to the church. And from that time on, there was a very active church uh, where people uh, would have, there would be events had that held there. There was a regular uh, ceremony held there was a, it was a, uh, on a, on a Sunday where the minister would come and they, they would have a service and it was quite a popular place for people gathering. So I'll turn it back to Sam. I would like to point out something very interesting about this photo. It appears there's a ghostly figure captured in this 1941 photograph. I highlighted it in yellow there. Uh, see if you can uh, if you can see it. But if you look carefully, it appears like a man in a suit is standing outside the church where the cemetery now exists. This is one of the first known photos of the church. Some, some of the descendants of the church believe this is an apparition of one of the black settlers who built the church. If you ever visit the site, you can't help but feel an unexplained presence. In fact, some of the descendants feel a special sense of reverence. I still get goosebumps looking at this picture. I'll now turn it over to Harry again. And so, so once again, you can see the restoration of the church that took place after from the first photo, photo you saw, uh, the significant upgrades that took place in the church. And in, that happened with the County of Simcoe actually creating a committee uh, to uh, make sure that all of the uh, upgrades and, and the church would last for a long period of time. The, uh, there was the significance of the white community at that time getting involved to make sure that the church was maintained was not a small issue. It, it speaks about the relationship and the respects that the different ethnic groups had for each other. Uh, next slide, please. What ha happened, just to give you an idea of the significance to the community, in 1980, there was a youth who uh, got into a dump truck and ran into the uh, church and vandalized it. Now, the good part of the uh, was that the, this youth that did that had nothing to do with uh, with r racial aspects. It was just a young young guy that uh, got into some alcohol. But the what happened was when that church got ran into by that uh, truck, the community was absolutely enraged. And remember, this is the 1980s, and that show the the community rallied together and members of council included. And that church was put back as though that it never happened in less than a week by all the volunteers. And uh, so this speaks about not only was there a, a great relationship uh, and respect that happened when the Blacks were living in the area and occupying the community, but that respect continues to this day. And so next. So the in 2000, 2003, the Or African Church was designated a National Historic Site and by Parks Canada, and the church represents the important role that the Black militiamen played in the defense of Upper Canada and during the War of 1812, but it also is so significant as a representation, be, uh, representing the strength and the diversity and the uh, contributions that all the ethnic groups made to Canada. Next slide, please. Then after that long period of time, uh, the staff did a review on the church and they, they were really shocked to find out that the uh, church was on the verge of collapse. And if, it probably occurred from the leak that was in the roof and the, and the dry rot that occurred. And the, uh, the cost to re 
uh, of repairing that church was was significant and we could not allow it to uh, not go uh not i should say we could not allow it to stay in that condition but we were trying to also find a way to get it uh, back to its proper situation next slide please so i'll take it from here harry sure. thank you yeah. And that's when the crowdfunding campaign began. During Black History Month in February 2015, the township took a bold step and launched a crowdfunding campaign called the Journey of Freedom with a goal to raise $140,000 to help restore the church. We used the online crowdfunding site GoFundMe and shared the link on the township social media site. So I have to say a little side note, this was very unconventional for municipalities to run a, a crowdfunding campaign. Usually this sort of funding would, would come from government funding, uh, from um, volunteers donations throughout the, uh, the community. But um, for years we were trying to get uh, attention brought onto the church from the government and uh, we, did not, we did not receive any money. To demonstrate the strong community partnerships and engagement, we partnered with the Vaughan African Canadian Association as part of our ongoing efforts to attract the attention of government agencies to help secure federal and provincial grant funding. We also partnered with descendants of the church and leveraged on our existing strong relationships with community members, local historians, and the County of Simcoe to advocate in support of our fundraising initiatives. CBC National News, TV and radio covered the launch of our fundraising campaign and the story and the history of the church, including every local media outlet across Simcoe County. The media attention surrounding the crowdfunding campaign was quite extensive. This is the CBC national story. Where some people might see a dilapidated roadside shack, Janie Cooper Wilson sees the long history of local families like hers. The vapor covering and plywood protect the little log church built 166 years ago by descendants of black soldiers from the War of 1812. It was the lifeblood of the community. All they had left was the faith in God, their strength, their tower, their rock. Okay. The British Crown gave the 25 or so black veterans and their families the same land grants as white soldiers and equal protection under the law, including the right to vote, all of it a first in yeah. North America. Here's Thomas here. Cooper Wilson is descended from Private Samuel Thomas, who fought the Americans yeah. at the Battle of Queenston Heights. This is his son, Charles, and his wife, uh, Jane Montgomery. Jane's father, Henry, was a trustee of the church. Many of the original black settlers and their descendants abandoned the area, heading to jobs at shipyards and railways elsewhere. But their little church endured. It was made a national historic site in 2000 and housed photos and relics of the region's black history. Even though local governments have spent thousands of dollars on upkeep, a leaking roof and other problems sent the church into such a state of disrepair that it can't even be safely entered now. The church right now needs some immediate intervention. If it doesn't, it, it, there's potential that it could collapse. But Oro Medante's mayor is determined to save the church. When I drove by that building, it really meant nothing to me until I started to find out what it, what it stood for. Now there's an online crowdsourced fundraising campaign to come up with the $140,000 needed to repair the church. What I say to that Oro is... Oro Medante's communications director, Sam Othman, was inspired to get involved in the effort. To me, the church is so symbolic of uh, our, our freedoms and our, our rights here in Canada. It also represents a legacy Cooper Wilson wants to see passed on to her grandchildren's generation. I don't want to die and see this church on the ground. Experts doubt the church would last another winter. The hope is to raise enough to repair it before that and save a little known part of Canadian history. We're on Charles, CBC News, Oro Medante, Ontario. 
News of the story to save the church reached thousands from around the world. Donations started pouring in worldwide, and within a few short months, we raised over $92,000. For me, the most inspiring donation was for $5 that came in from a student who heard about our story and gave us all he could afford at the time. And this is the message he posted. Amazing history in Ontario. It is important for Canadians to celebrate our history as the ground we stand on has tremendous significance. Wish I could have contributed more, but I am currently a student. It was remarkable how our story and campaign touched so many hearts, regardless of race, color, or religion. We even received donations from those who indicated they were atheists and wanted to see the church saved because of its historical and cultural importance to Black history in Canada. Soon, provincial and federal governments joined the collective effort. Through our partnership with the Vaughan African Canadian Association, the township was awarded just over $94,000 towards the preservation project from the province of Ontario. In July 2015, the federal government, Parks Canada, awarded the township just over $77,000 in support of the preservation of the church as a national historic site. After the government funding came in, the total amount raised for the church was over $263,000. In July of 2015, we shut down the crowdfunding campaign since we exceeded our fundraising goal that was set for $140,000. Even after we shut down our crowdfunding page, people still wanted to continue to donate towards the preservation of the church. Our success did not stop there. As part of the launch of the federal government's 20th anniversary of Black History Month in 2016, the story of the Oro African Church was included on the Government of Canada's website, along with a photo of the church featured on the commemorative anniversary poster that was amongst Canada's most influential people and places. I now turn it over to Mr. Hughes. Harry, you may be on, on, on mute. Thank you. There are a lot of very interesting things were that were uncovered uh, during the uh, work that was done around the church. There had to be some archaeological work done, of course, and to find out what was under the floor. A couple of the real notable things was the uh, floor in the church, when they took the boards up, uh, there were the names of some of the people who were volunteered to put them down, which was kind of neat. But perhaps the most significant thing of all was when they had to take uh, chunks of the beams out that were rotten and replacing them. And when the church was built, the ch chinking uh, to keep the wind out was done by mud. And when they took a, one of the beams out, you can see the fingerprint there. That is a fingerprint of one of the uh, workers who had actually, uh, that way back at that time, uh, had put the mud in that area. And it was kind of neat. And next slide, please. Now, when we were looking at the church and looking at the building itself, we were interested in capturing more than just the, the things that you got, could actually see. We, we realized that there were a number of residents who had lived in the area <clears throat> that were probably in their 80s or 90s that had actually been there when there, there were events that were happening at the church. And one of the things that they, uh, was very commonplace was that the apparently the uh, Black community believed that if Christ was going to come back to Earth, it would happen on New Year's Eve. And there used to be real real religious ceremonies going on there most of the night that the, a number of the residents would come up and, and see. So we heard a lot of stories like that. that the one that, if you can stand a groaner for a moment, the one that was kind of Interesting to hear was the farmer across the road uh, had his milk cattle. And if you farm, you'll know that when the cattle need to be milked because of the pressure on their udder, they will uh, come to the barn on their own. And that was commonplace. The farmer went out 
and found out that the cows were not there. So he went looking for them. And where he found them was right along the fence where the church was on the other side. And they were listening to the ceremony that was going on in the church at the time. And that was kind of a neat story. And here's a groaner. Uh, the the groaner come up. That's where the term holy cow came from. <laughs> okay, next story. Next slide, please. Now, you can get an idea of, in, of the extensive work that had to be done in order to re, uh, re, re, do this church so that it would last. The church it was not on a foundation. It was only on rocks. As a matter of fact, one of the logs had completely de, uh, disintegrated. And, so, and because it had to have a foundation under it, the church had to be picked up and moved. And you can imagine a building that old uh, being picked up and moved off the site so it could a building foundation could occur and then be moved back again. And everybody knew that day was coming and they were there with their fingers and toes crossed and hoping that the bu building wouldn't fall apart when they were ready to move it. And we have a video that shows the move. Harry, if I can just comment quickly on that, um, I was there to witness that, and even though it only moved, you know, that slight little bit, um, there was a line of uh, members from the public who wanted to watch the church being moved, but I was standing next to two of the church descendants, and they were holding my hands so tight. I couldn't feel the blood in my hands. And we all started crying when we saw that church move um, and get shifted and not fall apart. It was really, really um, a miracle. Over to you, Harry. Thank you. Then came the, with all the work that was done, then came the day for the celebration and the grand opening. And we were absolutely astounded by the number of people who showed up. And we we had uh, a number of things very well coordinated. And with all of Sam's ingenuity, one of the things to kick off the opening was to get a flyover. And as you can see in the audience, we had some really significant dignitaries. We had the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario present. Uh, we had representatives from the uh, from the Black community from the, and the descendants and other people from right across Ontario and some of them from the United States. We had representatives from the Gray and Simcoe Foresters and quite a large group were there. Now, of course, uh, one of the uh, things that we wanted to do was to have a significant person be the moderator and and Penball Clements uh, from the Argonauts, as you may know him, is, is quite witty and uh, was just the ideal person. And he volunteered to MC the program. Now, Penball Clements apparently has a, one of those uh, reputations of arriving just in time. And of course, the, uh, it didn't matter what time uh, anyone arrived, we got going. The, air, the flight could only occur at a certain time. And we were really anxious, wondering where he was because the planes were due any second. And it turned out that as Penball Clements was trying to get up the third line where all the cars were parked and get to get through there, everybody was stopping him, wanting him for an autograph. And however, he did make it just in time and uh, kicked off the show with a nice booming flyover from the air show. So the next, uh, thing that occurred in, uh, as far as the formal opening, there is a, a slide showing the celebrating Canada's strength, diversity, freedom, equity, and, and inclusion that that church represents. And that's what makes it a national historic site. Okay, 
In 2016, the Township of Ormidante was the recipient of the Community Leadership Award and Excellence in Conservation Award by the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario and Ontario Heritage Trust. Only one award is given out provincially for the Community Leadership Award. However, Ormidante was the only municipality in Ontario to ever win both awards in the same year. The township also received the President's Award through the Ontario Historical Society. Even after all the awards and recognition, our greatest success and achievement has been in inspiring others to share the story of the church and keeping its history alive. This is a quote from the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario about the church and its significance to Ontario and Canada. The church is at the heart of many stories fundamental to Ontarians and Canadians. It's a story of community and neighbours coming together to preserve the church. And it's a story of freedom and equality. Hearing her say these words to hundreds, even thousands, was the greatest achievement and validates our success. The Oro African Church is the subject of a fictional children's book being used in schools in York Region. While public schools in Ormidante have included the history of the church as part of their educational curriculum. Also, you will find the story of the church featured in a book titled 150 Stories by the Office of the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, published to celebrate Canada's 150th anniversary of Confederation. I now turn it over to Mr. Hughes. Thank you. Once the uh, church was restored, it was really important that the church be, fu be functional. And the County of Simcoe, with all the interest that was going on, the County of Simcoe linked with the museum and they provided interpreters for the summer. So there were a lot of visitors that came in. And during that time, there was a lot learned way beyond uh, what we'd ever dreamed of from some of the visitors who, were, who, who, who came along to the site, some of them from the United States. And uh, so the, the county not only helped restore the church and, and but they also linked together to make sure to help out with the history and the, and the interpretation. And just to give you an idea of, of some of the things that that are, how, how important it is to some of the community, uh, we'll, the next slide will show you. After this couple was married, they wanted to make sure that they sort of went back to their roots and they asked if they could visit the church. And I was pleased to to have them come in and. Uh, they wanted to learn a lot about the history. And are, there are a lot of people almost every weekend when you go by there in particular, there seemingly is someone stopped at the church all the time. And we would really like to see this church give back to being very functional. And the amount of money that we raised was way beyond what we in, had anticipated. And we already have money now in, in reserves that will allow us to build particularly a parking lot that will allow uh, functions to take place and uh, we are looking to continue the story. Next slide. We'd like to thank you for your time. We really appreciate this opportunity to share our story with you today and hope that you'll sh share it with generations to come. I know there were some uh, comments and questions about some of the history and we'd be pleased to entertain those. Thank you, everyone. Are there graves associated with the church? I can answer that if you wish, Sam. Yes, there is a, a cemetery that is there behind the church. The grass is not cut on, on, on the cemetery itself. That's a known cemetery where they're actually uh, our, our graves, but it's believed that a larger portion of that church property was a cemetery as well. When the, unfortunately, when the uh, radar center, you probably know about it, the, uh, the one on the dew line that they call the, 
Edgar Occupational Center, when it was being built, the road from the African church up there was very muddy and the workers used the part of what was the cemetery as a parking lot. But we did go over uh, that with a lot of uh, ground radar searching to determine that there, that we were not interfering with any of the uh, grave sites. There, the, unfortunately, the markings for the uh, uh, graves that are there, I think they were all wooden crosses and none of them exist now. But do we know how many graves are there? Like if they did ground penetrating radar, they probably caught the numbers of anomalies that uh, exist. We we uh, actually have a list of the people who were buried there. So we know their names, but we don't know the exact locations that they are. And the, the ground penetrating radar that we did on the, uh, on the front area uh, didn't show us the, because of the, I guess, what had happened with the parking lot and the extra fill that had been put in didn't show anything. So there wasn't anything to be found in that area. Right, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? If I can make a comment, I did see the uh, comment come up uh, po pointing out that the Wilberforce settlement, and that's what the area was called, uh, preceded the Underground Railway. And that is quite correct. There was a lot of folk folklore going on. The Black community coming to Oromadane began with the Black soldiers from the War of 1812. And the that whole settlement area that was laid out was to grant land to the Black community all the way from the shore of Lake Simcoe right up to uh, Penetanguishene. It was a huge area. And there were people who followed that were not members of the uh, uh, soldiers from the War of 1812 who came at a later date. So uh, some of those uh, Black soldiers, I believe, may have even been some of the Blacks that came over with the Loyalists uh, when uh, from the Revolutionary War and were in Ontario prior to that as well. But there were, were certainly uh, Black members who came later on that may well have been connected with the Underground Railway. As you saw, Janie Cooper Wilson uh, indicated she connected one of her residents to that. Well, I have a question and um, I'm just wondering, so, so what happens now? Um, it, how, how does, um, how does, you know, you talked about the weddings and, and possible, you know, visitation and what happens now? Is, is, is the work done? Again, Sam, if you would like, the one thing that's good is we do have some money to do something with because of all of the unbelievable fundraising efforts and, and program that went on from everyone in the community. What needs to happen now is that to become a functional church. And and right now, you, you'll know how interested I was because uh, I made a deputation to council, uh, Oromadani Council, just a, about two weeks ago, asking that very question. And right now, there is a, a group uh, called the Oral Freedom Institute who found some links to, the, to this church, to a large church in the United States. The one member was a member who had a member of a group who had ridden the bicycles from all the way on following the route of the Underground Railway, apparently all the way from New Orleans, all the way up to Canada. And he, they, they're stationed in Scarborough. Now that's one of the groups that is looking to do, uh, do three things. One is to enhance the site in terms of it being interpreted. And uh, the other, of course, is to arrange for visitors. But at the same time, there needs to be a local group associated with that. And we are in the, uh, in the process right now of creating a local group who will also work in harmony with that, that, that association. Just wanted to make sure we get it before we um, get sure. into the next one. Um, it's from Natalie. She says, I'm a school principal at Warminster um, Elementary, very close in proximity. We are studying this incredible, incredible space with our grade eights. Is it open for field trips? By all means, uh, just call the township office, and if you don't get any, uh, if, if 
things aren't successful there, just give me a call and I'll make sure it happens. You can give me a call anyway. Thank you so much. Our, our kids are so interested in this. They're doing a full inquiry project. So to actually be able to come inside this space will be very remarkable. So I'll be in touch. Natalie, I see you're, you're from War Minister. I, I hope the group will give me permission to let them know there's a significant site near you as well. You are, are you aware of the Sir Sam Steele Monument? No. Well, similar to the Black community being uh, locating near with half pay officers in um, in or Oro Township at the time, there was a, a settlement. I showed you the Monk Road that came from Ottawa to Penetang Machine, and right at the corner, near the corner of uh, the Mount St. Louis Road and Highway 12, there was a ha British half pay officer named Elm Steele, who was fought in the naval war in the naval wars with Na Napoleon. Now they wanted somebody with naval background in case there was battles on the Great Lakes. So he was a half pay officer who settled there, and he was the father of Sir Sam Steele, who became uh, Canada's greatest Mountie. Uh, his uh, the St. George's Church is where the cemetery is for the Steele family, except Sir Sam was buried in, in England. But at the same time, I, I discovered uh, myself that in addition to, to Elm Steele, there are actually houses, log houses in that area that were built. And there are other officers from the uh, military. So similar to a military set up in Oro, there was one set, of, set up right near you. And interesting enough, uh, are, are you familiar with Cahagwe? Did I ask you that? No, I'm not. Well, Cahagwe was the largest Huron uh, settlement in, in the entire area. It was located uh, right near Mount St. Louis Road going towards Aurelia. On both sides of the road, it was a and, and it was the largest settlement, as I said. And there's actual evidence that Champlain spent the winter there, and so it's a really historic site. It was the archaeological work was done by Laurier University, and they had a summer course for teachers. So you have another very very much parallel uh, historical uh, location right near you that fits right into this whole picture. This is wonderful. Maybe you and Sam, I can come for a visit and see the work we're doing. Great. <laughs> I always enjoy I'm going to school. <laughs> I'll be in touch. I don't have a question. I just wanted to say hi and thanks to all of you for this presentation and for all the work that you did to um, preserve this amazing piece of history in our area. So thanks to thanks to all of you. Oh, thanks, Amy. It's our pleasure. And, you know, I was so glad to get your phone call because I, it wouldn't seem just quite right if Oro Medante was not in the picture during Black History Month. That was just me jumping into at a moment of silence. So, no, I just wanted to sh share, um, you know, my thanks for everybody as well for sharing your depth of knowledge. You know, it's really impressive. And I just want to thank you for, for sharing such important parts of our history. So, I know that like the story of the vandalism and the community reaction, uh, even though, you know, a lot of times it might be really silent when you see something like this happen and you see that mobilization and people coming out from Oro Simcoe and, and other Ontarians to rally, to pre sorry, to preserve the church. That was really impressive. Um, and it just shows, you know, who we truly are as Ontarians. So I know there's been a lot shared from folks here on the line today. And I just want to give you that feedback because you've put so much into this and I just want you to get that positive feedback. So you felt uplifted with your efforts as well. And, you know, I've learned more uh, as well from the war of 1812, uh, knowing some parts with Queenston and the local land grant were given, but I didn't um, have the linkage to, you know, the penitentiary area. And I had some family from there as well. So this has been an excellent session and uh, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to echo the call the same comments that have been raised by my colleagues and just want to say um, I am also prepared to um, to volunteer and assist as best we can. Um, and I know my colleagues from the OPP uh, were very much interested in not only serving the community, but being a part of uh, endeavors such as this and the rich history that we have in our great country of Canada. 
and the fact that we're embracing, acknowledging the significance of the various cultures that comprise this great country is very important. And uh, it is indeed something that we need to uh, to share with the rest of the world with this great gem. And I think uh, there's lots to be learned in regards to building partnerships and in celebrating within our differences, there are similarities. So uh, again, this is just absolutely powerful. And um, I'm sure that there will be a request for uh, other presentations with respect to the church. And again, thank you for allowing me and giving me this opportunity today to feel very enriched. I'm so honored and privileged to be here tonight. Well, thank you, Wesley. One of the things maybe Sam I may have warned you about is when you make a volunteer and an offer to volunteer in the mayor's present, uh, you can consider that you're signed up already. Well, that, I, I, yes, I kind of figured that. And from uh, my great first occasion of meeting you there at uh, Lakehead University and socialized with you, uh, it is indeed an order to be partnered with you. So uh, any time to be a part of an exceptional team like this, uh, you can't go wrong. Everyone, so if that's it, I just want to, uh, to remind you that um, uh, Simcoe County Historical Association is a not-for-profit organization and uh, we're able to put good things like this together because we have a membership uh, following. So if you're not a member, yeah, it'd be great if you'd uh, sign up. It's uh, membership fees are only $20 a year and it helps us do this and uh, a whole range of other things. And uh, if that's uh, not your cup of tea, well, at least go on our website um, and subscribe to uh, some of our newsletters or updates and uh, keep in touch. And uh, we hope to uh, see you if there are other uh, on our next uh, set of speakers. So if there's no more questions, going once, going twice. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Appreciate it, take care, have a great day.